Welcome, everyone. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, to you Elias uh, Kamun. I hope that my pronunciation is the correct Perfect. one. He's our guest. Uh, he finished uh, this famous uh, Institute CISA in Trieste in 2018. If you haven't heard about it, it's a really prestigious place, known also from this uh, developing nice ideas and collecting the best scientists from all around the world. And then Elias moved to Michigan, but only for two years. Yes. And then he moved back to, to Europe to, I hope uh, my pronunciation will be there again correct. So it's the Institut de Recherche en Astrophysique et Planetology. And now he's working uh, there in Toulouse, in France. He's working with um, Bojena Czerny. And his subject, as you see, it's active galactic nuclei. Of course, black holes are involved, probably. Definitely, yeah. So, Elias, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction and the presentation and, and for inviting me. So, I'm glad to be here. Uh, yeah, so today I'll be, is the sound good? Yeah, okay. So, today I'll be work, I will be describing the modeling of thermal reverberation in active galactic nuclei. So of course black holes will be involved and more complex physics there. To start with the active galactic nuclei as an introduction. So these are bright sources, bright extra galactic sources that have been detected in the full electromagnetic wave going from radio up to uh, gamma rays. And the current paradigm of explaining all that complexity in the electromagnetic uh, spectrum that we see is that we have a supermassive black hole at the center of galaxies. By supermassive, I mean masses that are going from, let's say, around 100,000, 10 to the 5 solar masses up to more than 10 to the 9 solar masses in the center of the galaxy. Next to it, it's powered. So all that is powered by what we call the accretion disk. So it's hot gas that is accreted by the supermassive black hole in spiraling around the black hole going down and radiating, mainly in the optical UV part of the spectrum. That's the bulk of the energy. And then around that uh, uh, accretion disk, we have a source of X-rays that's visible. So uh, AGN are bright in X-rays. It's what we call the corona. It's to make the analogy with the solar corona. So what I was saying that, just to recap, so we have the supermassive black hole at the center of the galaxy that's accreting matter, which is heated and then emitting in the optical UV. Around that, we have the hot electrons, what we call the corona, that's emitting in X-rays. If we go a bit further out, we'll see blobs or material gas mainly that is more clumpyish, that's orbiting at higher velocity, but it's very realized. And then emitting emission lines in the optical UV that are broad. So what we call the broad line region. Further out, we see gas of that is moving slower, well, but it has also less density. So it's emitting the narrow line. Which, so we have the broad line region and then the narrow line region. These are not very uh, creative uh, names, but it helps. And then if we move further out, we have huge amount of dust, molecules, and gas that is there, what we call the torus. Then these, uh, these are the main components of an AGN. We have around, observation speaking, around 10% of AGN that show strong radio emissions uh, due to the jet, to, to uh, relativistic collimated jets. So that's why we divide them into radio quiet or radio loud AGN. And now the, the, the names are moving towards uh, jetted AGN and non-jetted AGN, because even though an AGN may not be very radio loud, it does not have a jet, it's not radio silent. It has some radioactivity that is going, so now it's better maybe to say jetted and non-jetted, but the jetted ones are only about 10% of the whole population of AGN. 
Then, the, in the early 90s, there has been proposed what's called the unification scheme of AGN. Sound effects, nice. <laughs> so <laughs> the unification scheme of AGN that says, we, we do see different types of AGN, but all the AGN are the same. But what's happening is that we are looking at the systems from different angles. So if we are looking face on, so if we are here and looking face on, we will we'll be able to see most of the components. We'll be able to see the disk, the corona, be able to see the broad line region and the narrow line region. And these are classified as type one AGN. Non-jetted, I'm talking about the non-jetted here. Yes, yes, it's just schematic. Usually the jets are kind of symmetric, of course, but just to be able to show the different components. Yeah. So uh, we, we classify them as type one AGN. And then as we move closer to the, to the equatorial plane, we will, be, we will see every, the inner part will be more obscured we'll see more absorption and we will not be able to see all the components. So if we are looking, let's say, at an extreme geometry, which is edge on, so most of the, or all of the central part will be absorbed mainly by the torus. We'll be able to see scattering from narrow line region, but we'll not be able to see the, the broad line region. Similar Names could be done for the jetted AGN. It depends on how we are looking at the jet. Are we looking face on or inclined? So the radial luminosity will be different. The component that we will, we will be seeing will be different. And each part of them, each, each part of these components will be contributing to some of the bulk of the whole electromagnetic spectrum that we see. So mainly we have the disk in optical UV, we have the corona in x-rays, we have in submillimeter for infrared the emission, the reprocessing, for, uh, reprocessing emission from the dusty torus for the non-jetted AGN. Then for the jetted, we have different radiative processes that will contribute to the uh, a broad uh, spectral energy distribution. So, so in my talk today, I'll be focusing mainly on the inner, very innermost part of the AGN. So I'll be talking about the disk, and the corona. We, and the, by the way, the corona is there. We know it's there because we see the X-rays, we see the, the luminosity, but we don't know yet how precisely it's formed, what's its geometry, what's its nature, why it's there, at which distance. Is it just a blob? Is it more like a halo? Or is it due to magnetic fields that are there and forcing it to be closer to the disk? But we know from observational evidences that we have it, we have it relatively close to the black hole and that it's, uh, it's very variable and it should be kind of compact. It's not a large diffused uh, gas. Yes. Sure. Uh, compact. So in, in usually we use the units of gravitational radii so to give you an, so for a, a, a black hole of 10 to the six, so 1 million solar mass, 10 to the six solar mass, one gravitational radius is around 1.5 times 10 to the six kilometer. So we are talking here about dimensions in the order between six to 10 gravitational radii. So we are at around 10 to the seven kilometers ish in that order of magnitude. This goes to the subparsec to parsec scale here, the torus, more or less. It's, it's very large. They are different. It depends also on the composition, the sublimation, the sublimation radius, etc. But it's, let's say, in the subparsec 10% or, or one parsec in that order of magnitude. And then, of course, everything else is closer and closer. Sorry? Yes, yes. OK. So why do we see them? How these X-rays are produced, etc. So we have the disk. And if we take, 
if we slice the disk in annuli in small rings, each annulus will be emitting a thermal black body like spectrum. So if we take each of them, each, each annulus here, I'm taking large annuli just for a presentation, each of them will have a black body spectrum. And then if we integrate over the whole disk going from the innermost stable circular orbit of the black hole up to very far, we, will, we have to integrate and we'll have this uh, spectrum that is a multi-temperature black body spectrum for the, uh, for the accretion disk. This accretion disk will be emitting kind of ice in many directions, and some part of that optical UV light will reach the corona. The corona is made of hot electrons, translativistic electrons, so we are talking about a few million and more Kelvin, so things are moving fast. So what's happening is that we'll have the electrons in the corona will inverse Comptonize the UV optical light coming from the disk, so they will push that spectrum from the UV to the X-rays. And the spectrum in the X-rays will be practically like, can be uh, phenomenologically explained as a power law with a high energy cutoff here that is dictated by the temperature mainly of the corona and the opacity of the electrons and a low energy rollover, a low energy cutoff that is dictated by the temperature of the accretion disk. So we have the UV that go from the disk to the corona, they get inverse Compton scattered, they give us the X-rays. But that's not the full story, because then this corona will be radiating everywhere. In the rest frame of the electron, it's emitting isotropically. So one part will reach us and we will see that what we call the primary, so this uh, power low like spectrum and there's another fraction of those x-rays will go and irradiate the disk. The disk will reprocess those x-rays and re-emit it in our direction, what we call it as the reflection spectrum. It's not a proper reflection as in the mirror, but because the photon will go that way and that way, so it's like a reflection path. So we call it the reflection spectrum. It's practically reprocessing the x-ray light in the disk. We have different features in that relativistic reflection, in that reflection. So we have emission lines in the soft and mainly at 6.4 kilo electron volt, we have the iron K alpha emission line. And we have a continuum emission, a continuous emission that's called here, that's speaking in the uh, hard X-ray, what we call the Compton hump. Because everything is coming from the inner part of the disk, so Relativity is important, general relativity is important, so we don't see the lines as very narrow lines, but we see them broadened and uh, smooth due to the relativistic effects like the uh, uh, gravitational lensing, like the light bending, like the gravitational redshift, so which will change the shape of the line and will not see a very narrow emission line, but we'll see things that are broadened and smooth. So we have uh, observational evidence of that reflections, of that reprocess, repros, reprocessing light, reprocessed light from the disk. So if we look at spectroscopy, we do see here, this is a ratio of an observed spectrum uh, to the power low. So just to see what's the ratio. Yes. Yeah, yeah definitely. Yes. Exactly. So, so it so so it's ionized mainly also by the X-rays. So we have, so it becomes more and more ionized, but also depends on how much flux is, is going is received in each part of the disk. So we don't have a one ionization state. The ionization have, follows a certain profile that depends on the elimination, and there also the general relativistic effects will play a major role because if the X-ray source is very close to the black hole, a lot of light will be focused on the inner part which, which gets it very ionized and then the outer part will be less, uh, less ionized. So, so yeah, that's true. So if we compare the data, so these are from uh, Walton et al. 2014. If we compare the observed spectrum 
to just a power law that we expect from just without any reprocessing, we see that we have huge residuals and especially we see the iron line at 6.4 kilo electron volt and the Compton hump that's peaking in the hard X-rays. There are also other evidence of reflection coming from uh, studying time lag, so time delays between different parts of the electromagnetic X-ray part, X-ray spectrum, so the soft versus hard, etc. And we also see a negative lag, so practically this light here is emitted after the, the primary power law, so it's negative, it's just the, the convention, and that also if we take the time lag as a function of energy, we see also that it follows a shape similar to the, to the reflection, so here it's speaking around 6 to 7 kilo electron volt where the iron line is expected to be. So the reprocessing by the disk is supported by uh, observations. But then, it's not the full story, because if the X-rays eliminate the disk, part of it will be reflected, but it's not the full story, because there's another part that will be absorbed by the disk to account for all the incident flux that's coming because we need to conserve energy, conserve photons, etc. So what happens when this is absorbed? That's practically what I'll be describing at the thermal reverberation of the accretion disk as follows. And of course, we can back it up by observational evidence. So there are now tens of sources that have been monitored on a daily basis using uh, SWIFT, an X-ray uh, instrument, an X-ray telescope, or HST, or even ground-based telescope. So we look at those AGN on a regular basis, and we can construct the light curve of these sources in different energy, in different wavelengths, going from the UV up to the Z-band. And if we do a, a cross-correlation uh, analysis, so if we compare the light curve in one band, and we take a reference band, and we compare the light curves to that one, we see that these, as we go at lo longer and longer wavelength, there is a, a shift in the, uh, in the correlation that goes longer and longer. So there is a delay between the shortest wavelength and the longest wavelength that increases with wavelength. So there is some kind of free procession. There is something that's a pattern that's repeated. So if we follow this line here, let's say, if we have this peak here, we see that it's shifted and broader as we go in, in wavelength, and then it becomes broader and broader. So it shifts. So this, this has been seen in different sources, mainly now the monitoring is happening for local bright AGN. And this cannot be due to fluctuation of accretion rate. It's because if, the, if there is a fluctuation of accretion rate, this should propagate inward, and then we have to see an inverse trend. So instead of increasing with wavelength, it should, uh, what happened? It should, uh, the lag should decrease with wavelength, which we do not see. So the very plausible and the most plausible explanation is this is due to thermal reprocessing. So we have the X-ray by the X-ray. So we have the X-ray that eliminates the disk, it gets absorbed, then it will be re-emitted in our direction. It will heat the disk. So the temperature of the disk will increase. It will be re-emitted in our direction with a certain delay that increases with wavelength. People try to, people try to use that to see if we can really explain the time lags that we see, the time delays that increase with wavelength. So they said that if we have the source here, it will illuminate, and then we will see uh, light in different wavelengths. And if we say that the time lag is practically the light crossing time, using standard uh, uh, profiles of the accretion disk, what's usually called at the Shakura Sunyaev alpha disk, so we have the temperature that goes down as uh, distance in the disk to the power 3 over 4, the temperature is inversely proportional to lambda. Then we have the, the time lag tau that's proportional to mass times m dot to the power 1 over 3 and to the lambda to the power 1, 4 over 3. If we use that prescription and try to fit the, the, the observed time delays, we can, people could reproduce this 4 over 3 trend with quite uh, good accuracy, but they could not 
fit the amplitude of these time lags. So if, for example, for this source, if we expect it to have an accretion rate in terms of Addington that is around 10% of Addington or so, this, this line will be here. So it's much below the observ observational data. And in order to match, we need to increase and increase the accretion rate to match this, which is not backed up by observations and which implies that uh, there, may, there might be something wrong with the, with the modeling that we are using or our comprehension of the accretion and the accretion disk. So as I said, the shape is perfectly fitted, perfectly recovered, but the amplitude is not. And people were asking, are this amplitude uh, discrepancy due to larger disks than we expect or no? In other terms, larger accretion rates that, from the one that we expect or no. However, all this, all these assumptions or these relationships do not only depend on the mass and the accretion rate as we saw, but there are more physics that are involved. It's not only simple Newtonian physics, there's also general relativity that plays into, yeah, that enters to the game. And, okay, sorry, yeah, fine, thank you. Uh, so, And uh, so these were not taken into consideration. There's the disk reflection that should be also computed properly that has not been done before. So what we propose here, it's a new model following the same physical logic. All the logic is the same. We're not changing anything, but just taking into consideration all the physics that we can think of. So we assume a black hole with a, with a spin a, which is practically the angular momentum normalized to the mass, it's uh, in the in the Kerr metric. Uh, the black hole mass, the accretion rate, the luminosity of the X-ray source, its position, its spectral shape, and the dimension of the disk. It's a very it's a razor thin uh, disk approximation. There is no flaring, there is no dimension, nothing. So we're assuming because we are including GR, we are assuming what's called the Novikov Thorn accretion disk compared to the Shakura Sunyayev, which does not assume a lot of generativistic effects or approximation. So if we have, as we said, if we have the X-ray source that's eliminating, so the absorbed part, the absorbed flux is the incident minus what's reflected. We can estimate what's reflected based on the ionization state of the disk and the position of the X-ray source. And then what we can get is what's the new temperature of the disk that is introduced by this absorbed flux. And here, as you can see, I'm putting two times the absorption flux because we assume symmetry. So we assume that if we have one X-ray source, let's say on top, we have a similar X-ray source that is heating the disk from down. Um, but we cannot see it, but it contributes to the heating. So the new temperature is two times the absorbed flux, so the heating that we are adding, plus the original Novikov Thorn temperature that we had if we had a bare disk non eliminated, divided by sigma to the power one over four. And then from that, we can estimate now having the new temperature, we can estimate the new total flux that we have after the heating and then estimate what's called the response function. So how much is the reverberated flux? How much is the absorbed that, the, the flux that's absorbed and then we can see it and we normalize it just to, to have the correct physical uh, uh, units. We normalize it to the luminosity of the X-ray source and the duration of the flash. So what we are doing is that we send the flash to the disk we let it propagate using gray tracing codes, and then we see how much we have. And this flash has a certain, a very small uh, time, which is delta t. So we can there have the, what we call the response function, and at the end observe integrating over all uh, of the disk, we can have the final observed flux, which is the original novikov thorn flux plus the integration going from zero to infinity of C, which is the response function of the disk, times the X-ray elimination at T minus T prime times uh, DT prime. So, and I will come back to this one later because what we are seeing now practically in X-ray, in, in optical UV from the disk 
is what is responding to what the X-rays did a certain time earlier. We have the X-ray that may vary now, what may vary. They will go and then we will see the light in the optical UV after a certain time. So this is responding to what the X-ray did at a certain time T minus T prime. And then I will come back to that later and explain more about that. So just a reminder, we have full generativistic effects from the corona to the disk, then to get the reflection to the observer, and then go from the disk to the corona, to the disk, and to the observer. So we treat all the components with full GR, having, uh, following the, the, all the geodesic equations and doing GR ray tracing. So as I said, we send the flash and then we wait. We see what's, this is the response of the disk as a function of time, the flux of the disk that is reverberated as a function of time. And then we compute what we call the average time delay as following that. So it's the average of the uh, response function. So integral of t psi dt over integral of psi dt. And this is what we want to compare with observation later on. So first, what do we see? If we compare the responses in two different wavelengths, so this is a UV, this is in the I band, we see that the two responses start at the same time, which is not what has been argued before. It has been argued that it's the light crossing time, so we come here, we have only the light in the UV come peaking here, then we wait for the X-rays to come to the further out part, and then we see the I band. But no. When, when we have uh, a thermal radiation that's coming, it's contributing at the same time at all wavelengths. So this part of the disk will emit in the full electromagnetic spectrum following the uh, a black body-like uh, thermal uh, spectrum. This one also will contribute to the UV and to the, uh, to the optical and to the near-infrared. So the first thing that we saw is that the response function starts simultaneously at all bands. The second thing that we saw is that the, uh, the, the, the width of the response function gets larger and larger when we go to a larger wavelength, and this explains practically the trend that we see that the, 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 toe, the, the, the time lag increases with wavelengths because we start seeing contribution from colder and colder material that will still contribute to this uh, long wavelength. And then if we compare our prediction, which is in blue, to what has been predicted in the past, we see always that for any height of the source, for any accretion rate, that our prediction is always larger than the prediction that has been estimated before. So which might explain this discrepancy and the amplitude of the, uh, of the time lag that has been seen before. Because at all times we have larger time lags compared to what has been seen before. However, we are following kind of the same uh, shape. So this four over three that was predicted, we still have it, but about with, with a larger amplitude. So if you want to look at the effects of some of the interesting parameters, if we look at the accretion rate, we see that the time lags here that I plot here increase with accretion rate because we are, increase, we are changing the temperature of the disk so for the same X-ray luminosity, so here what we are doing in the next few slides, what I will show, I will be fixing the parameters, all the parameters except one, and let this parameter vary. So for the same accretion, for the same X-ray luminosity, the difference between what we observe, the total and the Novikov thorn is smaller for higher M dot because the temperature of the disk is larger, and then the amplitude of the uh, response function decreases, and the disk elements that contributes to a certain wavelength extend farther out because the disk is hotter. So we will see uh, uh, the, the light at this wavelength coming from farther out region. That's why the, uh, the, shape, the, the width of the disk response increases and leading to an increase in the, in the, uh, uh, in the delay. If we change the mass, everything scales with the mass, the disk gets bigger and bigger, and then of course also the time delay is measured in day will increase and increase with the mass because the disk is, all, everything is scaled up. Then if we look at the spin parameter of, the, uh, of this black hole, also what we see is that 
uh, the as the spin increases, the time uh, the time delay decreases. This is because so for a spin we have larger m dot we have we have lower m dot sorry so larger in amplitude and narrower which is the effect of m dot because what we are having is we have m dot in physical units the accretion rate is the luminosity divided by the radiative efficiency so as the uh, the spin increases the efficiency will increase and then the accretion rate will decrease in physical unit because we are fixing it to the same unit in Addington. So we are normalizing to Addington. So we have colder disk and we see this effect. Yes. Yes. Yes, yes, the, yes, 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 the, the spins, so then we go to a Schwarzschild uh, case approximation or we, we have the care approximation. So we have it from zero to one, to, one. Or okay. to maximum. Okay, thank you. Yeah. And then, of course, if we change the height, the position of the X-ray source, we will be, if, it's, if the source gets higher and higher, it will, eliminate further out regions of the disk, the X-rays can reach farther out regions, and then this will increase the time lag that we see, but it also affects the shape of the, um, of the lags. And finally, if we change the luminosity, we are now changing also the ionization state of the disk. So we are changing the reflected spectrum, and we are also adding more heating to the source so there is a balance that's changing between the reflection due to ionization and how much photon is x-ray photon is absorbed by the by the disc leading to the heating and then we see a small change here as so as the x-ray uh, luminosity increases the time delay increase a bit and also the shape of the of the disc response changes so now the question is, okay, we have this setup, we have this model that we can test for different parameters, but then can this be able to explain what we see? Because we can do all this work, but then the main question is, can you explain observations? Can you explain what nature is doing? So what we did here in that paper in 2001, so instead of fitting every parameter, what we saw is that we took all the ranges of parameters that are changing, and we tried to come up with an analytic prescription for the, for the time delay as a function of height, the mass, the accretion rate, and the X-ray luminosity. I'm not showing all, all, here all the details of these functions, so each of them, A, F1, F2, and B, are functions of height, uh, accretion rate, luminosity for a non-spinning and a maximally spinning black hole. Just taking the two extremes and to see what we get, trying to approximate that. So coming, having this, we can, for example, fix the mass to, an, to a measurement that's coming, let's say, from reverberation of the H beta or from other, from other uh, synergies. So we can know, let's say, we assume that we know the mass. We have X-ray observations, so we know the observed luminosity, and then we can fix it. And then the only two free parameters that we can have are the height and the accretion rate. And then we can fit this for these two spins. And what we see here is that this is for a set of seven sources. We can explain properly the height, uh, the, the, the amplitude, and the shape of the observed time delays for all of these sources. Now there are the generalities because Actually, in most of the cases, we can see that uh, so uh, red and blue are for spin zero and one. I don't remember which is which, but for both of them, so we can see here or here or here, most of them that both spins can fit. But the problem is that they will predict different values of height and accretion rate. So these are the contour plots of accretion rate versus height. For, for the same fits. And you can see that they, in some, ca in some cases, they are all the same. We cannot really distinguish between them because the quality of the data is not the best quality of data that we can have. But in some cases, we have really difference in order of magnitude, especially in the accretion rate. So what we said, okay, that's fine. 
So what if we took measurements of the accretion rate from uh, optical SED fitting or from bolometric correction? So different values of accretion rates that we think people think that these are the values of the accretion rate and compare with what we see. In some cases, let's say in Markarian 142, here maybe, here, we can prefer a spinning black hole to a non-spinning black hole because these horizontal black lines are the, the values that are measured using optical of, for the accretion rate and we are more in agreement with those. In other cases, anything can fit because of the quality of the data. So even here we can maybe have prefer, uh, preference of a spinning compared to a non-spinning black hole by combining both. Should the measure accretion rate or actually the inferred also had error bars, so there won't be line here, but there should be some bands, right? That's, the that's true, but people usually when they are using this, because this, what's happening is that they take the, let's say the luminosity in, a, in the B or the V band, and then they correct it for a bolom, what we call the bolometric factor. So they multiply and people usually in the literature are not all the time uh, having this what errors uh, that, that's a very big uncertainty because we, we don't know it because even this volumetric correction there are different models it has also different error bars and it should be I would say in the order of the 10 20 percent maybe but it depends because also this volumetric okay. correction yeah. depends on the accretion rate itself yeah. so it's a well, apologies for, for stopping you but no, I no, think if this if you could take this rate and your model for somehow for granted, you can falsify some kind of a physics because it's very hard to predict, expect non-rotating black hole of this mass. Exactly. The way we can understand they form, right? In yes. the galaxies. Definitely. No, no, definitely. So okay, thanks. Yeah. And here also you neglect the issue of the viewing angle, right? Uh, no, no, we have the viewing angle because it's also it's so one of the key key parameters. Yes, I did. Uh, no, so I didn't show it here, but for the for the viewing angle, what we saw is that the time lags do not depend strongly on the viewing angle because most of the light that we are seeing reverberated is coming from further out regions that are not effect, affected strongly by the, the lensing effect of the black hole. So we saw a very low dependence on, of the viewing angle on the, uh, on the time lags. So we fixed it to uh, an intermediate value that can work because we didn't see any effect there. But it all, it's also included in the, in, the, in the model, of course. So here I'll focus on, briefly in the last part of the, of the talk, I'll focus mainly on one single source just to see what we can do further going a couple of steps further, which is NGC 5548. We chose that source because it was the first source to be heavily monitored for a few hundred, a couple of hundreds of days with HST, with SWIFT, and with ground-based telescopes. So we have an amazing data set that we can try to, uh, to explore. So, if we only fit the lags, we can fit the lag for, so it's similar to, it's one of the sources that I've shown before. So for spin zero and spin one, we can get a height here for the spin zero. These are one sigma of uh, something between 23 and 60 RG and a low accretion rate. And if we fit with a spin of one, we have kind of similar range of heights, but a larger accretion rate, as you can see here. So we went one step further and having all these responses, we can now see, model this, model the power spectrum of the light curves. So we take the optical UV light curve and we take also the X-ray light curve and we produce the power spectra, which gives us the variability of the, of the source. And we tried using these uh, responses that we produced before to fit simultaneously the X-ray power spectra the optical UV power spectra and the, time, uh, the, the optical UV time lag simultaneously. This has been presented in Panagiotto et al. in 2020, and we have an updated version of that work that is submitted now to AppJ. And trying also testing the same configurations, we, went fra we can always fit everything simultaneously. So practically, this model could explain the time lags and the variability time scales and the variability behavior in 
all wavelengths. And we have, as you can see here, if we compare those two, we have the height is kind of the same range, but the accretion rate is now slightly better constrained, especially in the non-spinning case, which was preferred based on the, uh, as I showed before, uh, based on the, the measurement from uh, using bolometric correction using luminosities. So one more step further, having all this physics, we can also predict uh, spectra. We can pro predict spectral energy distributions. So we updated the code and we have now the accretion disk and we have two flavors, let's say, of the, of the configuration. One flavor where to power the X-ray source, because as I said earlier in the beginning, we don't know what's the nature, how it's power, how this X-ray exists. But if we assume that this X-ray source, all the X-rays are powered by the disk, so we need to extract energy from the disk. We don't know, still don't know how, maybe magnetic field, we don't know. So if we can extract energy from the disk using some magical power so far, and power the corona, we can see how much how this will change and how this will create differences in the spectral energy distribution. We have also another flavor of the code where the X-rays are not, the energy is not extracted from the disk, but somehow given to the corona and we don't know how. So just to try to test different, uh, uh, different uh, geometries and different assumptions. So what you assume is that within a certain transition radius or transferring radius, everything goes to the corona and powers the corona. And then beyond that, we have the normal disk that we had before. So here, just something that's very important to notice is that in order to do that, if we want to fit the full spectral energy distribution, we cannot fit simultaneously X-rays and optical UV. Because as I said, if the optical UV that we see is now, it's responding to what the X-ray did a certain time before depending on the response function because this x-ray needs time to go to the disk and then to be seen in our direction so it's all depending on the x-ray luminosity that was some time t minus t prime before so we cannot fit simultaneously the x-ray and the uh, and the uv there are two things that can be done to overcome this problem either we have very long observations of few hundreds of days. And then we say that, okay, look, we have an average spectral energy distribution. We assume that this is the average state of the source. We take the average spectrum and we try to model it. Or what we say is that we need to chunk that into parts and then we take the optical UV at a certain time and then we integrate the X-rays from this time backward up to a certain time, let's say one day or two days, depending on the source and on the responses. So what we will, I will be showing here, the results from the first part. So by taking the average spectral energy distribution going from uh, the Z band up to the X-rays here uh, that are shown here. So we could model this, uh, uh, the spectral energy, the average spectral energy distribution using our model. So using the same physics, we favor a spin, a large spin, an accretion rate which is in agreement with the, with the accretion rate that we got by modeling the time lags for a high spin. We can estimate how much trans energy is transferred, what's the inclination of the system, the, and here the inclination plays an important role because it changes this mainly also the X-ray spectrum and the other parts because it's coming from the inner part of the disk also. And we, can, we try to get an estimate of the radius of the corona. And here what I'm showing is that the different parameters, the different free parameters that we had as a function of height, because we cannot let everything be free to vary because first the models are complicated, there's a lot of degeneracies, and it's very time consuming because we are ray tracing everything. So what we did here is that we fixed the height at different values going from very close to the black hole up to very far uh, heights from the black hole. And then we tried to fit for a fixed height and estimated what's the value of each parameter. And then we saw these dependencies and these here in gray are the region or the height uh, accepted region that we got from the time lags. And here these are the 
these are the regions that are expected to match both the time lag and the, the time average spectral energy distribution. So this so far is just taking the disk. And as I said before, there's another component that could be present there, which is the broad, what's called the broad line region that will contribute significantly to the optical and UV. And we, will see, we already see a lot of emission lines, etc. These were not taken into account in our model, but so we fitted without by taking out those uh, empty, empty uh, circles, which where we expect the broad line to to, uh, to significantly contribute. And then by adding them, we see that indeed, there is an excess in this region that is around 20 to 30%, which is practically what was expected and what was seen from uh, the analysis of the broad line that has been done in Fausno et al. in 2016. So the good thing is that we do not over predict here, we under predict, so we account for an excess that will be uh, due to the broad line region and we are within the limits of what's expected to be. To conclude, so we have a standard accretion disk model. We didn't invent a new physics. We just take, took into consideration all the physics that could be entering into the game. And for many sources, we will be able to explain the time lags in shape and amplitude. And for this particular source, we were also able to explain the observed power spectra, so observed variability in the, going from the optical to the x-rays, the spectral energy distribution as well. What's left to do is to, to try, as I said before, we can try to model the variability and the spectral energy distribution, which is a work in progress. We're also working on improving the fitting of the time lag because before all the results before were were based on the analytic approximation of the time lag. Now we are trying to have a more physical way to model the time lags. Briefly speaking, there was a problem that's uh, pointed out in the literature of also a similar problem that the disk should be larger for QSOs, for very bright quasars, based on microlensing uh, effects. So due to microlensing, we can measure the half light radius of so practically kind of a dimension of the disk and using the standard model before uh, people were saying that the disk should be larger so we have similar effects and now using this model we could predict this light, half light radius and we are and this was submitted sorry this was submitted and we see no discrepancy so we can also explain that and obviously it's all the all that i've shown mainly in the uh, spectra and the power spectra are for one source in order to see if that really holds, we need to extend to more and more sources, which are planning to do in the future. I think I, I still have maybe a couple of minutes or no? Like one minute. Oh, well, so I will leave it here with the conclusions. And thank you. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I count, accounted for these five minutes you yeah, lost, so. but still we should finish yeah, yeah, soon. Sure. No, no, sure. So we have plenty of questions. Maybe if, I think Mikolai was the first and then Wojtek. Uh, so thank you very much for a very nice talk. Um, I'm curious about the uh, the part of your the technical details of your talk, uh, of, your, of your code, uh, and especially how the ray tracing works, because in principle, the, the problem you're solving is quite difficult and quite tricky. Uh, do, do you consider the, this uh, this corona a point source or does yes. it have a source? So yes, it's yes, a point it's source. a point source. It's what we call the lamppost geometry. I see. Yes. And then uh, you need to calculate basically the flux uh, of, of this, these x-rays as observed at a given point close to the black hole. That's and on top of that, by, an ops by, by, the line, by the fluid element, which is moving at high velocity. So there's a lot true. of relativistic effects you it's have to take into account. It's all taken into consideration. So from the disk mm -hmm. to the, from the, cor from the point source, mm -hmm. to the disk, to this element of the disk that's expected to be moving, mm -hmm. and then from that, taking the time delay of that mm -hmm. also, then tracing it from the local element of the disk mm -hmm. To the to the observer, uh, and and how do you calculate the flux? The, you have to also take into account the lensing by it's by this. so the lensing, light bending, gravitational redshift. Also, the energy will be shifted mm -hmm. due to where we are, where the photon is falling 
and the disk, is it closed, is it far? Mm -hmm. All of that is taken into consideration from the point source mm -hmm. to the disk element and then from the disk element back to the uh, to the observer. What about multiple imaging? Do you have to take into account many images of the of the of this cloud? Yes. Yes. Okay, so it's everything. <laughs> yes, yes, it's it's mainly so most of the the bulk of the theoretical part of the GR has been done by Mikhail Dovchak from uh, from Prague, who has been developing this code since two thousand and four, and each time improving and improving. And I think we are now at the state of a, one of the most complete uh, codes that trade GR, in every single aspect of that. Yeah, thank you, Elias, again for that very nice talk. Uh, I was interrupting quite. Uh, no, a bit, no, so, it was so good to clarify points. Uh, oh, thank you. But well, so so of course I don't model AGNs, but I'm a cosmologist who try to model galaxy formation from time to time. So this is all very cool to me, as well. Uh, my question is the following: So uh, I've seen many times that you show this very thin line prediction for the response functions or for the delays. Once you yes, yeah, so once you once you uh, once you fix some of the models, the parameters of the model. Yes. Now I realize that you have this post lamp approximations as a point source of Corona, but yeah. is there any new parameter you can think of that would uh, take into account the phenomenology that accretion disks and Coronas and all these geometries do not come exactly like you assume them to be, they might have some distribution function. So for example, we can naively expect that most of accretion disks would be more like a cons in the, in the in the um, uh, if you cut them, not the thin rays or yes. Saturn like disks. and and because I was wondering if you if you have some kind of nuance pointer that would maybe uh, you know a model a little bit uh, or factor a bit that this nature doesn't produce idealized toy models, which is of course a very good starting point, and then you maybe you could get some uh, ranges of your predictions okay. to compare with the data. So so uh, in, so there are uh, two ways. One is related to the disk, and this is what we are planning to do instead of now taking a thin razor to add an extension like a flaring disk or a vertical extension. This is on our to-do list. Uh, of course, now adding all these complications will create much more complicated stuff to do, but this, this is on our, uh, on our list. Then the second thing is uh, the extension of the corona which is a very important question because, okay, for different purposes, it's good to approximate it as a point source, but we all know it cannot be one point source sitting there. That's a bit complicated. So there is a model by uh, Wanda Zhang who treats the corona in 3D, taking full GR. Uh, he has, I think, two or three geometries, a sphere, and the slab, and I'm not sure if I delegated one, but at least those two. So we are trying to push forward to include those Monte Carlo codes instead of having a point source, a more 3D uh, a geometry, but also this will, especially for time like this, will also complicate things. We are hoping to have something soon, but it will take some time to, but to, to do it. But I totally agree that uh, if we want to have the proper physics, we need to, to do that. Instead, what we did in the latest paper by, uh, that was led by uh, Mikhail Dovchak is that we compared our prediction of the uh, spectrum in X-rays from a point source to a 3D sphere. And we are within 20% of uncertainty based on the size of the corona, etc. So the point source seems to be a, an okay approximation, but we know it's not the, the real answer. Definitely. Thank you. Okay, thank you. We have also questions from online participants. So, Professor Ivo Białinski, Biruva, please. I'm a bit surprised that your model agrees so well, because we are supposed to believe that there is a lot of dark energy and dark matter. And they don't seem to have any influence, even though the conditions there are very, I would say, uh, complicated so dark energy should play some role can you comment on that well it's it's a dark energy is there but it does not contribute much to the observed electromagnetic spectrum that we see especially that these are very small regions that we are looking at in the space so we don't expect to have a very huge importance of any of the dark energy or dark matter especially the dark matter is also diffuse so and it's not interacting with uh, the electromagnetic light so we don't have uh, much 
influence of those components into what we see in the yes but dark matter changes the motion of these elements that you are studying uh, it, it, and all that no it should not change anything because we are really at the center of the galaxy so we are not follow we're not falling into any of the potential wells of the dark matter so it's already a well established very tiny structure small structure and the center of the galaxy that's not affected by the larger effect of the dark matter and the uh, and dark okay. energy mm -hmm. okay thank you i do not see another oh, question so i think suhani was the first and then you use hi a uh, very nice talk uh, so can you tell uh, at what redshift is your source located the source that you're so all these sources are very local sources within 0.001 a redshift of 0 0.01 maximum so are very local very nearby sources because we need them to be very bright in order to be able to monitor them properly with uh, with all so there are uh, now ideas of maybe extending that to brighter quasars that are uh, at larger redshift but then in order to do that you need much longer monitoring because these are variabilities that are happening on time scales of few days or within days so they are very nearby and very low very low mass but then if we want to go to a higher redshift we need longer campaigns to to be able to perform this kind of analysis i think with the uh, vera rubin lsst that would be uh, possible because they will be staring at the sky uh, regularly having collecting a lot of light a lot of quasars for a long time so that might be possible for high redshift in the future okay thank you so uh, in this plot can we say that the luminosity do, uh, does not impact the time delay much uh, the for these particular cases it does not have a huge effect yes but then in other cases we try to unphysically boost the x-ray luminosity a lot and there when we go to very high x-ray luminosity but of course it was just trying to see by hand we see then larger effects so these are for physically reasonable values of x-ray luminosities for those sources and the effect is not very strong and also this depends on whether we extract the energy from the disk or not but i didn't show it for to not complicate much the it has a tiny effect but it has i'm very sorry but you have to finish soon so we'll use the last question maybe in uh, will be just after this colloquium. So next two weeks we'll have uh, talks from young physicists who decided to move from science and they are working now in companies, in Citibank and in Google. So that's it. See you next week and let's thank the speaker again. Thank you.